I'm just curious this morning, how many of you still own VHS tapes? Go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah, you know, we, back in the day, uh, we bought those things because we thought that this, this was it. This was the answer to uh, recording things, watching things from Hollywood or whatever. We just easily put that thing in the machine and bingo, we're all set. We don't have to monkey around with what my parents used to do with the reel-to-reel stuff and that was all a bunch of headache. No longer have we got that. We got the videotapes that we can pop in. And so over the years, um, we have these machines that we thought was going to be great. However, technology moves on, and we find ourselves seeing our, these machines just lay around collecting dust, for the most part. Back when this technology was really in its peak, Tammy and I decided that we were going to buy a camcorder. Our son was only, was just about a year old, 1989, and we thought, this little guy has grown up and we want to capture his childhood on film somehow, some way, and I was watching the flyers in the mail, on Sunday papers, and I, and I was watching Sears, seemed like they would run the best uh, sale uh, uh, on these camcorders, and so when it, when it came back around again, we thought, we're going to make the purchase. And I can remember how expensive those things were back in the day. $999 I paid for that video camera. And that was $200 off. And so I thought we were getting a bargain. So, and then we got, so we got this, we went ahead and made the purchase. And this is not me, but it's, it's a picture of the machine that I had to carry around if I wanted to capture Zach and Hannah on this thing. And, and people would stare at you. They thought that some news channel was showing up and want, carrying this thing around. And I felt rather embarrassed, but it did the job. It recorded their whole childhood, both of them, and now we have all of these tapes like this laying around. And we're looking at this, and our VCR player quit working years ago, and it was long since gone, and we're trying to decide what to do, and lo and behold, we, we came up with an answer to that. We started converting it to digital, but nevertheless, back in that day, we even bought those home movies, you know, Snow White and uh, Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and all that. We thought, this is, this is great because the, even the next generation can even, those, those, our kids' kids can even watch these classical Walt Disney movies. And we were pretty excited. We thought, man, we, we've, got the, we've got the monkey by the tail here. And life is great. <laughs> but then technology changes. And no longer does our VCR player work and as a matter of fact last time we did watch some of our vcr tapes they were getting kind of fuzzy and we thought what in the world we thought the machine was acting up but when i read this article now i understand why those tapes are fuzzy according to this uh, lady and her colleagues her name is mary kidd and they spend their spare time converting these vhs tapes to digital format Because she said that the VHS tapes probably can't survive beyond 15 to 20 years. They never told me that back in 1989. But anyway, here we are. She said that the sounds and the images are magnetized onto strips of tape. But over time, the tape slowly loses its magnetic properties. Most tapes were recorded back in the 80s and the 90s when video cameras first became widely available. That means that even the best kept tapes will eventually be unwatchable. The thing is that many people don't realize their tapes are degrading. Even as you are sitting there waiting for me to get done talking, your tapes are degrading. So, she said that people like herself and her crew, they work endlessly trying to convert and preserve these intimate personal histories Otherwise, they would be lost forever. That reminds me of something that we as a church do to remember. Something very significant. Now, we understand that that things come and go in our world. We talked about that last week. We talked about culture trends and how things come and go. The way we dress and the way we conduct ourselves. And as far as the text went in 1 Corinthians, talked about head covering. 
And by the way, I don't see any of you women, I told you to wear your head covering this week, and you didn't do it. But anyway, you have that glorious head of hair on top of your head that serves as your natural God-given beauty. And so for that, thank you for wearing that. Did I save myself in that situation? <laughs> anyway, the, the idea is the culture trends, they all change, but we need to be relevant to the culture in which we live in, displaying and relaying the, the true and never-changing biblical truth. Paul's day, they did that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talked about that. This week, now, Paul is going to be heading into another area, an area that is very sacred to the Lord Jesus himself. As a matter of fact, it is something that we are to do as a body of believers, in which it doesn't make any difference if the cultures come and go, which they do, There is something most significant that must be continued to sought after and pursued in a very regular way so that you never forget. And that, of course, many of you have already seen you look down at the Lord's table. And that's you're exactly right by your eye contact on the Lord's table. Good job, you got an A. The Lord's table is one of the most intimate, worshipful acts that we can do as a congregation. Because when we come around the table, we share a common loaf and a common cup. And this morning, we are going to be talking about that, and we're going to be talking about the significance of that, and how we must never deviate from this very thing until the Lord returns Himself. The First Corinthian church, as you know, they did a lot of things that were really messed up. They led a very disunorganized, ununified type of life, especially as they came together as a congregation. Paul, specifically, is going to be sorting this out this morning as he talks about, specifically, the Lord's Supper. And as you turn there with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I invite you to turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible, use one of those chair Bibles in front of you. It's on page 958. And we're going to be talking about this incredible, wonderful ordinance that Jesus is going to be instructing His church to continue to pursue after. As we look at, begin at verse 17, Paul is giving them some instructions, and actually he's going to begin by telling them that what you've been doing is not right. And by no stretch of the means is this a commendation. Last week, we talked about this thing with the head covering, they, gave, they, they were given their accommodation, like one of the only ones that they were given. This week we're back to no com, uh, accommodation, accommodation, okay. accommodation, drop the A off. They're back to no commendation with their, with their conduct and what they were doing. Look at what he says in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. These people, when they came together, they were once again acting disunified in their life. We've been talking about this as we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians. A lot of things that they were doing, they were causing divisions and turmoil in their midst. And Paul here, once again, is pointing to that very fact that they need to be very careful about what this, their conduct is doing of this dis, disunified bunch of people. Look at what he continues to talk about these divisions in verse 18 and 19. He says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. I believe it in part. For there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So here Paul is talking about these divisions that are going on. And clear back in verse chapter 1, verse 10, he, talks, he begins talking about those divisions. Clear up until now, he's still talking about these divisions and how they are being played out in this church. There mustn't be divisions among you, by extension to us today. We must be unified together in one spirit. When we are disunified, when there is some problems that's going on within hearts. Disunification is a true sign of spiritual sickness within a body of believers. It is extremely destructive to our existence and to our effectiveness and to the glory of God itself. 
We need to be very careful about divisions. But Paul said, there's naturally a division that happens, though. Paraphrasing. There, when there becomes difficult circumstances among our midst, something very special happens. There is a division, a natural division that happens. It is what we call factions that happen. There is a pressure that's being applied that causes the wheat to separate from the tares. And Paul speaks to that. These factions are a purging process. Let me give an example of that. When difficult times come, we see the ugliness of our hearts show up. I can think of no better way in which pressure gets put on a congregation or even individuals themselves than the pressure of finances. <laughs> you want to see the ugliness of people show up. You want to see the ugliness of my heart show up. Press my finances. Press the church's finances. And you're going to see a rather unique, interesting effect that happens. And I'm not talking, and, and money is not the only one, way that this happens, but it's one of the most good illustrative things that I can point to at this moment. It shows where people's heart really is. Is it trusting in the Lord? Do they really, have they really committed their life to the Lord? Are they trusting Him? Or are they result, or is there something happening in their heart that really shows up this disbelief within their heart? And so there is a natural separation that happens oftentimes because of pressure that happens. And it separates the believers from the non-believers. But as far as the believers go, there must not be divisions. There must be a unification in spirit that must happen. And Paul points to the continual problem within that church. There are factions that, that happens. Verse 20 through 22, we see this perversion of the Lord's table rise to the surface. Paul says, verse 20, When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you, have, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I command you in this? No, I will not. There is a perversion that was happening in the church of Corinth and Paul was setting his foot down and said, this has got to stop. You go through these motions of having these elements of the Lord's Supper that Jesus gave to us, and yet you do something that's really not the Lord's Supper. You have these elements, the, the bread and the cup, and you even might even say some words of Jesus to help make it look like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you're perverting this whole thing. Your heart is not right. You come around this table and you do, you follow it all up. You must stop that. You've got to stop that. You've got to refocus upon this. And Paul will direct us, as he always does, and as the Lord Jesus on that night in which he was betrayed. He, was, he, he wanted people to be so focused. He wanted us, as we come around the table, to get rid of these things that even easily grasp our life. The pride, the envy, the feelings of superiority. We are like that as human beings. It doesn't take long for us, for that type of action to set into our hearts, into our life, because we are bent in that direction. And when we come around the table, this is a time when we must get rid of that. Otherwise, we come around the table and we pervert the whole, the whole focus. You see, when Jesus surrendered His life and His body, he did that to release us, to get rid of the sin that held us in bondage. He saved us from that. He released us from its grip. And yet, somehow, some way, because of our self-centered bends in life, we allow it to begin to creep into our life. That pride, that envy, 
That, you, you, you like that person that sits next to you or around you, but you know what? When it really comes push and shove, you're really kind of envious of them. They had the better job. They had the better pay. And you know, they had the better house. They had the better car. And all, before we know it, we begin being gripped by the effects of our sinful, prideful heart. And when we come around the table, we need to get rid of that stuff. Don't allow it to come in around the table because we pervert the exact thing that what Jesus set us free from. We need to resolve our differences through repentance and forgiveness with one another. We need to take care of that. Before we come around the table, it's insistent. Paul is insisting upon it, which comes from the Lord Jesus Himself. Which brings us to the very next passage in this subject. Paul is going to be taking this group of believers back to the very words and the actions of our Lord Himself. And these are things that we must never depart from. Understand, verse 23 through 26, and they're very familiar words to many of you. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do it, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Those words were actually right from Jesus himself, given to Paul. And so Paul, what Jesus is doing is something really amazing. (laughs) I want to take you back to that upper room. When Jesus and his disciples were observing the Passover, they were doing just what a good Jew was supposed to be doing. They, they gathered together in Jesus, by Jesus' instructions to this certain location, and they were going to observe this Passover meal. And we're not going to go into all the little different parts of the Passover meal, because they're really not relevant to where we're going to be at this morning. Where we are relevant to, and what Jesus himself talks about, is some significant parts of the Passover that's going to be brought over into what is going to be called the Lord's Supper. But here are, the, here are these good Jews that are in this upper room, and they were beginning to observe the Passover. And Jesus himself, he breaks, you might hate to hear this, he breaks tradition. Ah, I know I said it. He broke tradition. Yeah, we don't like to do that. We are very traditional in some of the things we do. I, let me push you on it. Let me change the way you observe Christmas. Ooh, I bet you don't like that one, do you? We, we like certain things that we do, and we want to be about that. To a good Jew, they were about for centuries observing the Passover, and quite frankly, they enjoyed that. And so they were gathering around the table, and they are observing the Passover, but Jesus is going to interrupt this tradition, and He's going to do something really radical among the midst. He was going to break the tradition. After Judas departs, he kind of spots him out and, and he instructs him to go do what he was going, his heart was bent to do. Judas leaves their presence. And then Jesus, part of this Passover meal that he was gathering around in this table on, he, was, he, inst- he took the bread. This part of the Passover meal, he takes that one significant part of the Passover meal, the unleavened bread, and he takes it and he blesses it. He gives thanks for it. And he broke it and handed it out to his disciples. We don't know who was all in that room. We know the disciple, the 11 disciples were there, but we don't know how many beyond that were actually there. There could have been several, or there could have been very little than the 11. But regardless, the bread was given out. Jesus breaks the bread and he distributes it because he wants to involve all of them in what he is about ready to do. It doesn't represent a broken body because there was not one of Jesus' bones broken on the cross of Christ. Christ, The cross, the crucified, the crucifixion. 
There was not one bone that was broken. His body was intact. It represents that Jesus was breaking and distributing to his disciples in order to have them part of the fellowship which he is inviting them to partake in. The details of the meal is not given to us in any one of the Gospels. It's, uh, there was a lot of things that happened there. But instead, there were a few components in which the Gospels concentrate on. That Jesus is going to be instituting a new supper which supersedes the old in every way. So we need to understand that He's going to be pulling a couple of those elements out of the Passover and remaking them a bit and bringing them into a brand new what we call the Lord's Supper or communion, sometimes we refer to it as. And so, what is the purpose of that? The purpose of that, first of all, the bread. It is His body, Jesus said, which is for you. And we need to understand, and I need to make this clear, because as much as I say it, there's still people around in this world, and there probably always will be, that think it's something different. (laughs) When Jesus took the bread... And he broke it, and he handed it out to the disciples. It wasn't referring to his literal body. His body was still intact. He didn't cut off his arm and pull his arm apart and hand it out to the disciples. Ridiculous. Absurd. Of course, that's not what he's talking about. He is taking this this part of the Passover meal, and he's giving it a symbolic meaning in which is for all of the church age to understand that this is the body that he has given for the believers specifically. It's a physical object to represent the most humble and selfless act ever known by man. Jesus was not doing it for himself. In no way. He didn't need the atonement. He was perfect. He did it for you. Those are the most loving words in Scripture for the believer. He did it for you. We need to understand that when we take the bread, when we enter into that fellowship with Jesus by taking the bread, we need to understand that this is the body that was given for you. You. That is purpose number one. But also purpose number two is the cup. God offers the blood of the Lamb of God for the remission of sin. He removes the sin and the guilt upon the believer, away from the believer. It's no longer a covering that those sheep and goats, the thousands and thousands of sheep and goats that were offered to cover the sin, no longer was it that. This was the holy, perfect Lamb of God, a perfect substitute for your sin and for mine. And He willingly shed His blood, gave His blood, poured it all out for your sin to completely remove it. This cup is to remind us of just that. But also the cup is to remind us that this is a new covenant. It is a saving covenant. It is a covenant that delivers us from sin to salvation. I don't know about you, but when I studied the covenant, I had to do all that study in in seminary, Bible college and seminary, and talk about all the, the covenants. We had to talk about them and write billions of pages of every this and that and the other thing. And, you know, it's kind of neat studying all of that. But it kind of always leaves you a little bit cold until we get to the new covenant. And then this is it. No more covenants have to be written about. I don't have to write any more covenant papers. (laughs) I'm done with them because this is it. This is the last covenant paper I have to write, the new covenant. And it's going to be the very last one until Jesus returns. It's a saving covenant and it delivers us from sin to salvation. It's the covenant really all the other covenants we're pointing to. That this is going to be a lasting, enduring covenant. And it's based upon His blood. He transformed the Passover to the Lord's Supper. Brand new that Jesus was breaking the mold of the Passover and instituting the Lord's Supper. Why does we do it? We're not there to remember Egypt. 
We're not there to remember all of those plagues that God performed on, on Egypt. That was pretty interesting, unique plagues. It wasn't to remember Moses and his bravery going up against Pharaoh. It wasn't anything to do with the Red Sea. It wasn't anything to do with any of that. And it's not even to remember the Passover. It's to remember the cross of Christ. What Jesus did. And that's how Jesus, what Jesus was instituting. Forget about that stuff. This is what I want you to focus upon. I want you to focus upon the cross in which I am about ready to bear on your behalf. It's for you. But thirdly, the purpose is for remembrance. And we say that all the time. As a matter of fact, it is so significant that we carved it in wood. (laughs) It's on the front of that table. And a lot of communion tables or Lord's Supper tables have that carved into the front. Because you and I are prone to be like those videotapes that you have sitting right now on your shelf disintegrating. (laughs) We get a little fuzzy. We forget the details. (laughs) I really think that I have pretty good memory on certain things. I think that I can remember stuff and uh, uh, certain details, and I share it with my folks a lot of times, and and they go, wow, how do you remember all that? (laughs) But then I go back to the tapes, and I think, you know, Rodney, that's pretty fuzzy memory. That really wasn't the way it happened. This is the way it happened. So you see for yourself, and I had to really get my thinking back in line. And you know what? The process of age makes our mind fuzzy. And even when I don't think that it's fuzzy, it is fuzzy. Okay? I, I remember something that is really not the way it was. And so we need a, something. We need something in writing. We need something in place in which will cause us to remember the very most important facts of what Jesus is instituting to his church. And so Jesus instituted this, not for that first century disciple audience that he had, but for all believers. For centuries now, we've been doing this, and we will continue to do it until the Lord returns one day. To remember, it's not an option for believers. All right, It is to be done as often as you drink it, Or the literal translation goes like this. Do as often as you drink. So there is a repeated process that needs to be going on throughout the life of the believer because our minds continue to get fuzzy. (laughs) Even from year to year, it gets fuzzy. And the older we get, it gets fuzzy. Here I am being negative again. I'm so sorry about that. But I don't mean to be negative. It's the reality of the fact that things just kind of get, we need to periodically, regularly come back to the table and refocus. If you ever get a person in front of you that really doesn't clearly outline what the significance is of what we are doing, then you need to tell them, listen, sharpen up, focus, focus on why we gather together around the table. We need to know, we need never to forget, we must not ever forget what the significance of the table is. The remembrance is to go back into our mind and recapture as much of the reality and significance as possible. None of us was there. Some of you probably date back pretty close to that time, but you weren't there, okay? We're to go back as much as we're to remember in in, in Scripture and go back and to rehash Scripture and meditate upon it and get as much of that reality that we can possibly get into our thinking, the right thinking, And understand the significance of it. And remember as much as we possibly can based upon Scripture. So number three is remembrance. And then number four is there is a proclamation that happens when we gather around the table and participate around the elements. As often as you do, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. The the salvation that comes from Jesus' blood, His body and His blood. It's a permanent feast, one that's going to continue on. A feast, by simplest definition, is a plentiful supply. When we come around this table, we are reflecting, we are remembering the plentiful supply of God's abundant grace that He has bestowed upon us. It's not transferring grace, it's a remembrance of the grace that was imparted to you as a believer. So, it also... 
there is a proclamation to other people. We are proclaiming until He comes. Now the very last section here, oh, let me give you a summary. I almost forgot this. I'm trying to speed along here. Let me just give you a summary of what the Lord's Supper is. Just scan right down through it. It's a remembrance. It is a spiritual fellowship with Christ. It's a spiritual fellowship with the saints. And, and by definition, a saint is anyone that has placed their faith in Jesus Christ. You go back to the very first verse or two of this letter, and you'll see that very clearly. It's not some type of uh, sainthood that some, some man bestowed upon someone. It is any believer that has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the biblical meaning. Also, it is a proclamation of salvation in Christ And then lastly, it anticipates the Lord's return. Because when He returns, we will drink it new with Him in the the heavenly realm. So, that is a summary. But the rest of the text, let me just finish this up here, because there are some house rules that we need to be sensitive of. And we need to evaluate this in a very careful manner. Paul says in verse 27 to 34, Therefore... Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. So that is why, so that is, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Verse 33, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. So, very quickly here, there is an inward dress that we must put on. <laughs> and not just put on, we must, it must be appropriate. It's not a covering, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way our heart must be fashioned as it comes around the Lord's table. There is an unworthy way that we come around the table, and Paul says that we must not do that. The definition of unworthy is an improper or careless way of coming around the table. And we must not do that. So, how do you come in a worthy way? Well, first we need to evaluate our hearts. Examine our hearts. First of all, do you belong? Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Repented of your sin? Placed your faith in the, the blood and of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin? Are you walking in obedience with Him? Do you really belong around this table or not? You need to be the judge of that. We don't, we don't card you. We don't issue little uh, salvation cards around here where you're in or out. That sort of thing. You know your heart. Do you belong or don't you belong? Secondly, the uh, inward rags of, of pride and selflessness, selfless, selfishness or contempt or bitterness or envy... It requires a self-examination. Are you carrying that about with you? You need to deal, have those heart uh, evaluations. And then lastly, when we come around the table in an unworthy way, there are consequences to be had. And Paul said that there were believers in that first century church that were coming around the table and they were suffering, there were illnesses, there were There were sicknesses that were going on, and yes, even some deaths in some circumstances, because they were coming around the table in an inappropriate way. And you know what kind of gives me the the little weebie-jeebies, is I've heard some pastors talk, some older pastors, and that have had um, people in their congregation that they knew that they were involved with a with a rather openly sin, sin that was very blatantly spelled out in Scripture to be away from, and yet they were repeatedly continued in that, and they came around the table on a regular basis, and they suspected, and they weren't judging them, but in the back of their mind, they were thinking that that could very well have been a result of them coming around the table, 
Because it's just as effective today as it was in the first century. And they even suspect there's been a couple people in their congregation that have died, quite possibly because of coming around the table, prematurely dying, because they came around the table in an unworthy way. Uh, it's, it's scary, but it makes you wonder. But you need to evaluate that as yourself, for yourself. Is your heart right as you come around the table? We need to understand that. So, in an application, let me just give you those pointers again. We need to examine our hearts first. Psalm 139 cries out to God, Search me, O God, and try my heart, know my heart, to see if there's any wicked way in me. There is a searching process that we need to ask God to shine that light into our hearts and and don't allow any dark spaces or even shadows of darknesses in our hearts. We need to expose them and we need to deal with them. It is most crucial that we do that. And every time that we come around this table, we are pleading with you to please examine your hearts and examine them well. And we will not, we promise that we will not shame you. If you say, you know what, I need to deal with some things in my life before I come around this table and I just need to let those plates pass before me, we will not put your name in a bulletin. We will not put it up on the screen. We won't shame you. We won't drag you out to stone you in any sort of way. But what we are pleading for you is to examine your heart. And if there is something in there that needs to be dealt with, you need to take care of it as quick as possible. And maybe, maybe... And I challenge people on a regular basis. Maybe there's somebody even in this room that you're at odds with and maybe it's been carried on for years and years and years. Envy or pride or selfishness or something that you need to, as quietly as you can, go over to that person, tap them on the shoulder. Can we take care of this right now, please? And there are plenty of rooms in this building that you can take care of that because the stakes are awfully high. The seriousness of this matter must be dealt with. Or if it's not in this setting, that you quickly, after this service, take care of that. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's an email. But you need to take care of those matters of the heart. And secondly, he calls us to discern the body. There is a reflective meditation of the body and the blood of Jesus that we are called to have. We need to understand why we come around the table. It is not because it's a fun thing to do. It's not because I like the taste of grape juice. (laughs) It's not anything like that. And it's not anything out of a self-centered way. It is to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the reason why these elements are before us. And that's why we do it on a regular basis. We must discern the body. And then lastly, we must wait for one another. It has the idea, obviously we focus on Christ, but it also has the interest of one another. How are we treating one another? How are we dealing with with situations in our lives? The table is not to satisfy a physical appetite. Because if it was, you wouldn't get much out of that little tiny cracker, okay? Just saying. (laughs) The table is not to satisfy any physical appetite, but it is to satisfy a spiritual appetite. I hope you have a spiritual appetite to come around the table to be unified with Christ in a very intimate, worshipful way and with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a special time. A very special time. There is a seriousness of contemplation through humility that draws together our fellowship with the Father, the Son, and with all the saints. It truly is a family time. And I hope you enjoy coming around the table as you reflect and worship. I thought, it would, I thought I would do something a little bit kind of special for you. It's a little treat. And uh, we're going to uh, I have a little video clip. And uh, Jason, go ahead and start switching my, the computers over. And uh, this is a theologian by the name of J.I. Packer. He's like 150 million years 